from our virtual studios in the Netherlands and Camarillo, California. It's time once again for the Marketing Geeks. Yeah, where we get geeky about stuff that has to do with marketing. Man, we we uh, this this show the show I am so excited about because we have the guest that will uh, fill your ear holes with knowledge like no other. <laughs> That's right. We have the guest that ends all guests. He is going to blow your minds with some of the latest technology and uh, things that are coming down the pipeline. We're going to talk about AI. We're going to talk about conversational marketing. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is a guest that uh, uh, we have been trying to get on our show, and finally, the moment has arrived. In fact, we have pushed aside all other guests who are clamoring to be on our show simply to bring the following guests. They can wait. They can wait. (laughs) But we can't. So with that, get ready for the biggest knowledge to ever hit your skull. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Marketing Geeks. Hello, everybody. Our uh, our guest is uh, uh, quite a uh, an accomplished person. And before we get to our guests, we're going to uh, express a little bit of capitalism. So stand by. He is the VP of Marketing at uh, Drift.com, which is a conversational chatbot platform. You must check it out. He's a co-host of the Seeking Wisdom podcast, a co-creator of Hypergrowth, the world's fastest growing modern business event. Uh, he's author of the number one best-selling book on conversational marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dave Gerhardt, thank you so much for being on the show, sir. That was the, that was the, the most, I, I didn't know where you guys took me in that intro. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, well, oh, I, where did I land? I'm, am I still here? Or? Yeah, you're, you're here, baby. You, you're still you here. Landed. I told you. Okay. I told you to fasten your seatbelts. You it's know? hard to believe like, that that was live. It just felt pre-recorded, didn't it? No, no, it was. No, I knew it was live. I knew it was live. I could feel the energy. Thanks for thanks for having me. I I appreciate you all having me having me uh, on the show. So happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, and and so uh, g- give us a uh, for those of our listeners who are not familiar with. Uh, uh, with Drift.com, with you, give us a little, give us your your uh, elevator resume and tell us all about your it. elevator resume. I love <laughs> this term. <laughs> yeah, so 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 I'm I'm, I'm VP of marketing uh, at Drift. Drift is uh, the number one conversational marketing platform in the world, and I just always wanted to say that, and and it's now true by G2 Crowd uh, customer reviews, which is awesome. But um, yeah, if you if you don't know about conversational marketing, the uh, conversational marketing, the way that I think about it is um, conversational marketing connects you now with the people who are ready to buy now. So unlike traditional marketing sales where you go to somebody's website, you fill out a form and then a BDR chases you down for six weeks until you either die or unsubscribe, um, <laughs> the Drift actually connects connects you now uh, while somebody's live on your website, which is how people want to communicate and, and how they want to buy. I've been here for uh, three and a half years. I was the first full-time marketing hire uh, employee number like six or eight when uh, when we started and the company's now grown to uh, 300 people. We have three offices. Um, it's just been it's been crazy. We wrote the book on conversational marketing. We've we've grown one of the biggest events in in this space, and uh, it's been it's been a really fun ride. And uh, I'm excited because I think this is just kind of the hopefully it's the hopefully it's the middle of it. So I'm excited. Yeah. So wait, you said you were one of the biggest events. Do you have a, a conversational marketing event that you put on each year? Uh, it's, it's called hypergrowth and it's really, it's really about, um, it's about personal and professional growth. Uh, so we, we didn't want to have an event where like, there's so many events in this space where, you know, you go there and you're going to learn how to, you know, get better at, uh, Facebook ads or SEO. And we, we, we believe so much in like one of our core values as a company is, is always be learning. And we, we believe so much in like role models and learning from others. And so we came up with this concept of hyper growth, which is, Hey, what if we did an event that was really focused on personal and professional growth? And we didn't, we actually didn't bring you just marketing people. We brought you, uh, former athletes, musicians, artists, authors, in addition to those sales and marketing people that you might uh, expect to hear from. 
And uh, the response is the response has been amazing, and the the event has 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 been a ton of fun to do. So yeah, that that's a little bit more of the focus. We are adding because there's a there's a, a group of people, our customers, who do want a little bit more tactical stuff. We're we're adding a you know I guess more more of what you said in the beginning, a, a conversational marketing type of event. Um, this year because because there's a group of like we there's a there's a need for like people that kind of want a little bit more of a boot camp but i think most people will go will end up going to both events yeah now i uh yeah. and i was go ahead Andres. Oh, i was gonna say when 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 is the event and where can people uh find out about it to go to it yeah go to hypergrowth hypergrowth.com um there's actually three events so london so we're going to london in june june 10th we're boston in september and then uh the hypergrowth san francisco uh, event will be the customer uh, the conversational marketing event and that'll be in, in november hey can the marketing geeks do a live remote from uh london yes it's yeah. right it's, it's like right near me like I, I just a small little plane ride i could dr- actually drive to london from my house uh, thanks to the channel so Please. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, you heard it here first, folks. Live remote. That's right. It's uh, happening. And be, it's official. That, that would be awesome. <laughs> now, uh, I, I saw I saw you. Um, well, actually, I did not see you. I'm sorry about that. But I, I was over at Traffic and Conversion this year. I saw that you were one of the speakers at Traffic and Conversion. Um, and I believe the year before, David Cancel was there. Or, or I don't know if you had uh, spoken both years as well. Uh, what was that like at, at Traffic and Conversions, and how does that compare, kind of, to what you're doing at um, Hypergrowth? I know that they're purely marketing for one, but yeah, yeah. So, um, so we we've gotten to know the so so the company that that puts on Traffic and Conversions Summit is called Digital Marketer. We got to know the the founder and CEO Ryan Dice very well the last couple of years. He he asked uh, he asked David David was like one of the main speakers last year. He did a keynote, like, yeah first thing in the morning they did a fireside chat my i basically made my whole career by by getting david's um uh, leftovers and so people invite him <laughs> in year one people invite him somewhere in year one and then this year they were like hey you're you're not bad do you want to speak and so um so so i got to speak this year it was a ton of fun i love that event because that is like the digital like not to play on the company's name but that is like the digital marketing geeks right you want to talk about marketing yeah, geeks like yeah. the people who are at that that is that is the seo that is the seven tips to double your conversion rate from ppc <laughs> type of audience and uh it was a lot of fun i wrote a brand new talk for that and and got to give it and the the response was amazing i i, I did something i would never done before which is actually sell from the stage and so oh, I actually nice. so i tried to sell books on stage and it was it was so much fun it was a, such a learning experience but yeah that that was my probably my favorite event i've been to in, in the last couple of years that's awesome. a rush uh, uh, justin and i have done that and and man when you when you sell something and people actually buy it from the stage it's it's quite like it's yeah, we, we sold like, a $5,000 yeah. package from the stage and people actually said yes. And we're like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. yeah, yeah, sold like $25,000 worth of stuff in one, one day, one afternoon. That was, that was quite good. So, that, that, um, the, the other thing is like that, the, the, I mean, the, the adrenaline rush is amazing, but like what, what that really teaches you is, I mean, there's so many lessons in there. Like it teaches oh, yeah. you, I think so many marketers like, like come up with some type of sales pitch and then like, it becomes a PDF that you just like punt over to the sales team and, and you don't actually know if it's any good or not. And so that was like an amazing learning experience because I had to sit there and watch people either pull out their phones and buy or, or not. And, and then, or, or get all the feedback from people who were like, that was bullshit. Like you shouldn't have tried to sell me, blah, whatever. Right. And yeah. uh, so, so it was, it was amazing learning experience. I think we, we sold like over ten thousand dollars worth of books just from that day wow. alone, and and nice. it was awesome. So, good job. Well, you can't you good can't job. please everybody all the time. You're always going to get people that are gonna uh, that are not going to like it. You get people that love it. No, on the since we're on the speaking topic, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and I saw that you were a guest lecturer at Harvard Business School. What was that like? I want to hear a little bit about that. Did that did you feel like you were out of place when you were you know teaching at Harvard, or were you like were you like right at home? Were you right at home there? No, I, I was definitely not right at home because I'm I'm the furthest from an MBA uh, that you'll ever meet. Um, and so so the so I've I've done I, I've I've done that every single year for the past uh, four years now. And um, I, I, honestly, I just got lucky. So. So one of the professors there is uh, she was an early advisor to Drift, and they needed somebody to to speak last minute to her class of like product managers about how to do marketing. 
And it was a little premature to ask me to do it uh, because I hadn't really grown anything yet. This was like the first year of drift. And I, I hadn't like, I, I had no like personal big wins to my name really. And so um, she reached out to David. David was like, you should have Dave do it. And so I did it. And the response was amazing. I just tried to be myself. Uh, and then they, they've invited me back every year for the past few years. And that's actually led to a couple other opportunities within other classes there. Um, but yeah, honestly, I, I was like super intimidated. Uh, I am a guy that wears, you know, Jordans and a, and a, and a hoodie and I'm walking into Harvard business school, but, but, but David is like, he, he's really my mentor. Uh, he was like, he was like, dude, just be yourself. Like, don't walk in there. Like, don't go get a blazer and a suit, like, because you're speaking <laughs> at Harvard business school. He's like, he's like, be you. And, and that lesson has helped me in more things than just, just, just speaking at HBS. But that's what people want. They want the real you. And so, um, I've gone there, I've I've gone there now four years in a row. And, and it's fun because like you, what it's made me realize is like, not a lot of people know that much about marketing. Right. And, and Mm -hmm. everybody is always learning. And so a lot of the things that now kind of seem basic to me or, or basic to people that have been in marketing, like you're, you're talking to a group of people who are getting their MBA and they're all going to be engineers or product managers. And so, you know, a lot of stuff that you think about is obvious is not. And so it's, it's really fun to like go back and kind of like re-explain some of that. And it was definitely a, a learning experience for yeah. me. It definitely helped help with my confidence as a speaker. It's one of those like curse of knowledge things where you know so much and you just assume that everybody else does, especially because you're talking to a high level audience. But yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, not everybody's going to know. Yeah, so, one, yeah. One of the, one of the ways, one of the ways that I like first learned that lesson was, um, when I, when I was like, it was like my first two months at Drift and, and David as a CEO, as like a well-known founder and like good investors, he always, he always would like get these invites to like these, these like round table dinners. And so one of them was, um, this like private CMO round table dinner. And I was like, I wasn't even VP of marketing then I was just like senior marketing manager. And he's like, I want you to go to this. And I'm like, what you want me to go to this private invite with like these top, <laughs> these top 10 CMOs? Like, what, what, I'm, they're all going to go, hi, my name is, you know, Mary Smith. I'm the CMO. But hi, my name is uh, Dave Gerhardt. I'm a marketing manager. at. You know, like, I was like, what am I going to say? Uh, and he's like, just go, trust me, just go, just go. And I was like, okay. And anyway, I ended up texting him halfway through the dinner. I went out to the bathroom. And I texted him. And I was like, oh, I get it now. And what he told me was, he's like, congratulations. You just unlocked a new lesson. It's called reverse. Uh, it's called reverse role models. And what he meant by reverse role models was, I actually went to that dinner and I, and I, this is not to be cocky, but like none of those people felt that much smarter than me or had that much better ideas than me. And so that was like such an amazing experience for me in my career, because I think so much, like we're so limited by like what we think is happening out there. Right. And like, and so that was so eye opening because I was having conversations and I was adding value and sharing my ideas and people are like, "Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, we haven't tried that at my company. What do you guys do at Drift?" And so it was just really eye opening to be like, you know, even these people who you kind of put on this pedestal are, are are not that far removed. Like we're all kind of figuring this out as we go. And that was like a huge boost to my confidence, you know, to to go and feel that. So it was a cool lesson that he he kind of like forced me to learn that. Way. I think uh, I think it was yeah. in the Steve Jobs bio. There's a there's a one of the lessons that he learned is that the that everything around you has been created or made up by people who were no smarter than you. So that, I mean, when I heard that, that, that kind of just hit me pretty good because it's just like a kind of a reframe. You have to kind of like rethink everything um, because it, it just puts everybody on the same level. Like there, nobody's, nobody's smarter than you. Nobody's dumber than you. Like what's been created in the past has been created by people just like you. Maybe they were more ambitious, but they were people just like you. So I I like that because it takes away that idea of putting people on this pedestal. And like once you realize that nobody actually is smarter than you, then you can do anything. And and the point is like you can learn what they know. I mean, people might have more specialized knowledge, but everybody's like kind of on an equal playing field. And, you know, we put people on a pedestal, but there's no need to actually do that. Yeah, or just like look, there. I would say most people in the world are smarter than me. But yeah. but what what I what I really he's like yeah. Right? <laughs> what I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say the same thing about myself. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, but, but what I, what I what the realization was is like that doesn't always equate to like being any good at your job. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think especially when it comes to marketing, I you know I I I I think we get so caught up in like whatever everybody else is doing is like what most marketing people do. And so you almost have this like beginner's mindset advantage where like, if you don't know any of the rules, 
you're going to kind of find your way into some some great ways of doing things. And I think I've been able to do a lot of things like that because I I don't have this long history of of being a marketing leader. Or like I I didn't come from you know three generations of of business people in my family. My my mom is a is a gym teacher and my dad runs the food services at a at a at a college. Like n- none of them know about marketing or business, and so I didn't have that in my DNA. And so I think I've been able to be be lucky by actually like not being tainted by any of that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is that because marketing is changing so rapidly, uh, I found that one of the ways that I was able to garner business from a lot of people is just simply because, you know, most of the time they'd be like, well, we had this marketing company and they were doing this and almost every single marketing company out there is doing the buy the book, you know, Facebook marketing, uh, Google display network marketing, and, and very few uh, companies are really thinking outside of the box and trying new things. And, and, and if you just mention something that is, is different enough, uh, that's one of the best ways to get, to get business. Because it, 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 especially because if, if a marketing person is doing the same old, same old, uh, the tried and true methods do not work anymore. So it's 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 huge opportunities out there for anybody who just wants to take a chance and do something a little bit different. Yeah, and also because uh, you haven't listened to the show too much, Dave. So like we we try to differentiate ourselves here by and, and separate us from the other marketers. By uh, Andros has created his own segment on the show. It's called the Sex Robot Report. I'm sure you haven't heard of it, but every now and then we do that. We don't do it every episode, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, and, and I think it's it's pretty funny. But it's uh, it also I mean, the point is we don't take ourselves that seriously here and we also, we, we take the content seriously, but we, we also understand that you have to be differentiate yourself. You have to do things that other people aren't doing. I mean, if everybody's using the same swipe copy, then, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it, then people are going to get sick of it and they're not going to respond to it. And if people are still using what worked in 2014, that's not working anymore in 2019. Like it, the, the simple funnel of the, um, you know, go to a landing page, put in your email, sell a product. I mean, for the most part, that's no longer effective. I mean, there's a few people that could probably still pull it off um, if they have enough name equity, but it's uh, things, yeah, things are moving quickly. And I, w- I want to hear a little bit about what where you think marketing is going, Dave. And I know that you're obviously incorporating conversational aspects. And I, and I know that Drift uses machine learning on some aspects um, to do uh, some of that is automated. Some of it's not. You talk, uh, talk a little bit about where you think marketing is going, uh, how you've incorporated some of those things in, in Drift. And I want to hear a little bit about that from you. Yeah, man, that's I've been thinking about this a lot, not just because I work at Drift, but I was listening to a podcast the other day with Kelly Watkins, who was the head of marketing at Slack, and, and she's kind of gone off to do her own thing. But she she echoed something that I've said like in the last couple of months, which is like, I actually think we're about to enter the hardest decade for marketers. Mm-hmm. Mm. And what I mean by that is all of the kind of like tricks and gimmicks and not just getting like, not, I don't, I don't mean gimmicks. I don't want people to like think that all marketing is gimmicks, but I think a lot of the way, a lot of the, the plays of, of digital marketing that people have used over the last decade, are, just don't work anymore. Right? Like if you were, let's just like 2005, 2006, if you were one of the first companies to blog and create content, you, you owned like inbound marketing and SEO. Um, if you were one of the first uh, companies on an ad ad channel like Facebook ads or, or or PPC, like you could own any of those channels. Then there's like gated content and marketing automation and all this stuff that that like made marketing amazing because marketers were able to measure their impact for the first time. The challenge is now that all those things have become table stakes, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody has everybody has a blog, everybody has a podcast, everybody's doing video, everybody has ads, everybody's on social media, everybody has a newsletter. Go yeah. on forever. And digital right? courses. And so, digital courses. And digital <laughs> courses to teach you how to do everybody has courses, right? Or and, and there's enough education to teach you how to do all that. The problem is on the other side of the world, you have people. And as people, I don't know about you guys, but like I'm just fed up. I get I, I can't, I'm sick of my phone. I don't I want it on the other side of the room when I'm at home, right? There's I can't keep up with how much content there is out there. There's too much noise, there's too much information. Everybody's telling me their thing is the greatest. I can't keep up on Twitter. I can't keep up on email lists. I got to unsubscribe from everything. Like something is noise. To, yeah, there, there's too much noise. Something is about to break. Right. Well, let, let me and let so, me say one thing real quick because this is a great quote yeah. that uh, one of my uh, one of my mentors. His name's Matt Browning. 
Uh, he runs masterminds out in Orange County or now and he just moved to Michigan. But one of the quotes that he uses is that the world is drowning in information, but thirsting for wisdom. And um, and I think that's a that's a good quote because people. Yeah, yeah there, there's so much information out there, um, but people still need to find they need to distill it down and actually get them you know, actually absorb things as knowledge. And people crave people crave crave that still. Um because it, yeah, like you said, you're just going to get drowned in content in a content swarm out there if you don't just kind of uh, figure out a very specific thing you want to focus on and put all your energy into it. There's just there's just so much distraction. So so because yeah, of I think that, I think, how, I think how people do you recommend that. How do you recommend getting above the noise? Quit. Go do something else. Uh, go play tennis. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> no, I think yeah. I think there's a I think there's a couple ways to cut through the noise. And so go to India. So I, <laughs> yeah, just to go on one of those like j- those journeys, a, a spiritual realization, <laughs> a silent retreat, um, a silent retreat. No, I I, I, I we think gotta go to Burning Man, man. We and I will go to Burning Man. You and me. The desert. Have yeah. Quest. I would. Yeah, I sure. would. I wouldn't stand a chance at Burning Man. No way. <laughs> Too much. Oh, Andres has been the last. Uh, Andres has been like what are the eighteen of the last twenty years in there? I've never been. There. <laughs> That's pretty good. Your brain still seems to be okay. Yeah, um, yeah mostly. <laughs> so, so I think I think yeah, the way mostly. I think there's a couple ways to to combat it. Number one is like you have to change as a marketer. You have to change your mindset. I think the I think you have to you have to change from this idea of like there there is no such thing as demand generation anymore. Like you you have to create, like you have to, you have to do things that create demand, right? Obviously there's going to be stuff where like you, you do a Google search, you should, the right landing page or ad should show. But I think you have to figure out ways of like, how do you go out and actually create demand for things? And that could be maybe, maybe you go like, I, I love the angle of like more people going deeper on a channel, right? Instead of like having 20 channels, what if you were the only marketer that said, nope, we only have two channels. We have a blog and a podcast and those both two things are amazing and we're going deep on those. Um, the other thing, this, the other thing is like, I think the hack for being, for cutting through the noise is to be real and to be authentic and to be human. This is something that I'm so passionate about. Um, because I think like in a world where no one wants to be sold to, or nobody wants to be marketed to, you can't like, disguise marketing anymore, right? You And so the only way to do that is to be upfront, right? And to be real, um, you have to be like, yes, this is a, this is a sales email, but look, here's why I want to tell you this, right? And I think a lot of those like classic copywriting techniques of like addressing objections and handling false beliefs up front have to play into your marketing. The, the realest way to be real, right? To use that is to, is to show your face. And so I love video. Like I'm so bullish on video. And so, so are we at Drift <laughs> for that reason, because video is a way that I can market to you. And it's me. I'm not hiding behind, you know, uh, no name at do not reply.com or whatever the email is, right? Like I am showing my face. And so I think the best channel that companies have today are the people that actually work on the marketing team. And so a lot of people see what we do at Drift. And like, I publish a ton of stuff on LinkedIn and LinkedIn's become a huge channel for our business. And they say, but Dave, isn't that a risky strategy? Like if you're the face of that, what happens when you leave? Inevitably you leave Drift. Like, and I say, I don't know. That to me is such a limiting mindset where people are more worried about the consequences of like having employees be the face of the brand than they are like than they're ever going to get by benefiting from using that. So more people are worried about like, yeah. yeah, but what if what if um you know what if Lacey leaves our company? I don't know. Let's deal with that when that happens. Let's build multiple advocates, multiple faces of our brand. So I think you have to be real. That's one way to cut through the noise. Yeah, yeah. authenticity is is absolute key in all of this and. Uh, I've talked about this in previous uh, uh, previous episodes where right now I'm doing a, uh, a whole ad initiative. It's not even an ad initiative. It's just a, a social initiative where I'm making these one-minute documentaries about the employees at the company I'm uh, consulting for and, and uh, just about what they do and what their job function is and how they make this product. And so it's not an advertisement. It's just them talking about what, they, what they're passionate about with, that, with their job. And uh, we ran a huge uh, uh, Google uh, Display Network ad campaign and spent a lot of money on it. And we got a lot of uh, like brand awareness, like people saw the ad. But the most engagement we get is from these little tiny documentaries, putting them on LinkedIn, sharing them here and there. And people love it. And, and the engagement rate is through the roof. And it doesn't cost the company anything except what they pay me, right? 
So it's yeah, it's, I love that. I, are, are, I, yeah. Honestly, the, my favorite my favorite ads my favorite ads are like are people that make ads on their iPhone, um, <laughs> and they just they just pop up in your in your some of our best performing ads is like, hey, it's Dave from Drift. I want to tell you two reasons why blah 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 blah. Right? Because it doesn't feel like marketing. And the, yeah. the other thing is like the trick though is you have to always be that person. And so like my whole strategy is like I want I want you to I want to sound the same. I want to be the same person on this podcast as I am in in how I how my emails sound and how I sound on social media and how if you ran into me out to dinner with my wife and daughter on a Saturday night, I want to be that same person because I think you can't you can't fake it, right? I can't have like act, you know, marketing actor Dave and then Dave. And one of my favorite, <laughs> like one of my favorite lessons of all time on this is is from Patagonia, the Pat, the, the Patagonia CEO and founder uh, Yvonne Chouinard. Yeah, he basically said our brand. Um, he said our brand is to tell people who we are because writing uh, fiction is so much harder than writing nonfiction. And like I think about that. Think about that, right? If you're trying to write fiction every day, you have to think about what story do I want to tell? Who am I? What do I want to do? If you're writing nonfiction, I'm going to roll out of bed and go into work and you're like, this is who you get. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, Patagonia, that's, why, that's right in my backyard here. I mean, I'm in Camarillo. It's like, uh, it's like right down the street. We got Patagonia. The, the corporate office is right here in Ventura. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it's, supposed to, it's supposed to be amazing. It's supposed to be an amazing place to work. Yeah. Oh, they actually have, I, uh, one, I, of the link, I, one of the LinkedIn offices is up here too. They have a LinkedIn office up in, uh, in Santa Barbara. And then we got, we got Patagonia. I'm right in the hub, man. Good stuff. <laughs> He's in the middle of it. <laughs> well, and, and so, you know, and, and Dave, so this is, this is like one of the primary things that I think is really interesting. You see a lot of companies now moving towards this kind of authenticity marketing. I've often talked about how uh, President 45 has, he won his election by uh, coming across as often uh, authentic, where you, whenever he would say something outrageous, people would be like, well, yeah, but he's just speaking his mind. That's what people, you know, it's refreshing. And yeah, it's refreshing to, to hear someone speak with no filter. It doesn't mean that they're being authentic and it doesn't mean that it's, you know, great. But, but, but it, it is, it does show on some level that people are craving something that's different and, uh, and, and outside of the, of the norm. So uh, let me switch gears a little bit. Cause I want to talk about, you know, you're, you, you have, uh, you're the VP of marketing for a company that does marketing. So how do you do marketing for a company that does marketing? <laughs> very meta, very meta here. <laughs> Number one is you have to have thick skin. <laughs> yeah. You got to have thick skin because, um, marketers love to call you out on your, on your own stuff. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's that, what I'm wondering about. Yeah. Um, you know what? I actually think it's, it's, it, to me, it's the, the, my favorite way of, of doing marketing because it means that I, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. I'm not, I'm not making stuff up. It's not like I am, uh, I spent two, you know, uh, I spent two hours, uh, interviewing one of our product managers. And now all of a sudden I'm an expert in cybersecurity and I'm trying to convince you as an IT person about like, something I don't really know about. Mm -hmm. Like in some ways it almost makes you a little bit bulletproof as a marketer. It doesn't mean that I'm never wrong, right? I'm definitely wrong all the time. But what it means is like everything that I'm talking about is like stuff that I've done or am doing or like plan to do. And so it makes it real where like I can just walk to work and have an idea and shoot a video on my phone. Um, and that can be marketing for us. And so I love, I love that, that element of it is, Hey, look, I know it also, it also means like you can bring real empathy into your marketing. Like, Hey, I know exactly what, I know exactly what you're doing because I get a million emails. People try to sell me stuff all the time too. I, I know what I respond to. And so I, I really, really care a lot about like bringing that element in. Like I only try to create stuff that I would personally find interesting as me as marketer, Dave, not like the guy who's trying to market to you. And so yeah. it means I, I try to have like a really high bullshit meter, which is like, would I actually like every marketer does webinars. We do a lot of them here at Drift. Would I actually spend 45 minutes out of my day, which is already busy to like go on that webinar? Hell no. Okay. So then I'm going to, I'm going to try a different angle. I'm going to try it differently, right? I'm going to make it an on-demand video as opposed to webinar. Yeah. Or we're going to try and make a 10 minute webinar, or I'm going to make the best webinar ever because I want it to be that valuable. So I think it's really like, it's, it, it's forced me to like be real, which is kind of like a meta lesson on all this stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Um, but I, I think LinkedIn is a good barometer for me when I'm trying to detect bullshit like that, because like I get 
probably a hundred, maybe not, maybe not that many, but like 80 messages a day on LinkedIn from people that, you know, that most of them are using bots or whatever and sending out, uh, sending out generic, uh, copy and paste messages or, or they have software that does it. Um, but I, I, I read all of them, or at least I read the first sentence and I, you know, I, I have like little red flags. If, if it's something, if something sounds like a bot, I'll just disregard it, move on. And if somebody says something personal or they acknowledge that they listen to the show or something like that, then I read the whole email and I'll, and I, or they read the whole message and I'll respond to some. So from that, from that standpoint, it kind of gives me a, it gives me some more that I can base, like what, what works on me. And, and, yeah. uh, and I know you are traffic and conversions. One of the big themes there this year was personalization. And so I do see that, um, what works on me is personalization. Like at least the first sentence or the first couple sentences need to have something personal that, um, that only makes sense that only makes sense to me individually. Um, otherwise it, I'm going to be turned off because like I'm so drowning in emails and spam and so much of this stuff is just spam and everybody's doing the same thing and they all run free MailChimp accounts or whatever. <laughs> um, so, so what, how do you see personalization in this grand scheme? And, um, and, and I do want to, I do want to talk a little bit about, again, getting into conversational marketing more. And, I, um, and I, I want to hear, about like AI and things like that. But let, let me first, let's first answer that question. So what, what do you think about personalization and marketing? And um, I want to hear your take on that. My take on personalization and marketing. I think I kind of have two takes on this. I think number one, it's, ta- it's, it's gotta be table stakes for, for you today. And me, meaning like your website has to be personalized and relevant. Your emails have to be personalized and relevant. Your ads have to be personalized. And relevant. Like there is, there's no excuse. It's 2019. Yeah. Um, you got to be able to do that. But on, on top of that, my, my second point is almost like a little bit contradictory to that, where it's just like, I actually think the only way to be, to, to do personalization is to be personal. And what I mean by that is like to inject some of you into your, or you it doesn't have to be you specifically, but you or people at your company into your marketing. Yeah. And People, people want to know the people that they buy from and work with today. And so the easiest way to like be, to do personalization is to be personal. So an example of that is like, let's say, um, let's say I, I'm writing email copy for a webinar invite and it's tomorrow. Uh, and I'm, I'm flying back from a traffic and conversion summit instead of like, instead of that just being a thing on my to-do list and I write like, hello, uh, oh shit, I got to write this email. Okay. Uh, t- tomorrow at 2 PM, we're hosting a webinar with our friends at marketing geeks podcast and blah, 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 blah. The way I would write that email is like, Oh my God, I almost forgot to send this email, but I'm right now, right now you won't believe it, but I'm 33,000 feet above the air, uh, above the ground going 620 miles an hour on this jet blue flight. And I think I got Wi-Fi working for five minutes. Anyway, by the time I land tomorrow, we're doing this webinar at 2 p.m. with our friends at the Marketing Geese podcast. So we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Like the difference in those two emails is huge yeah. because you, you actually feel like you know the person in, in the other email. And so that's something that I try to sprinkle into, into like all of the marketing that we do at Drift. Okay. So, you, yeah. so brand personality, but not just a brand personality. It needs to actually be your personality. So you need to have a personality. And if you don't, you got to find somebody that does. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to. And like the, 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 the have a personality thing is so important like it's also the same advice that i give a lot which is like you got to pick pick a side right you can't be everything to to everybody especially today when there's so much noise so like i am okay if there's people out there who some people who don't like me or the way that i do marketing i'm totally fine with that because i know that there's a big enough audience of people who do and i would rather appeal to those people um than like worry about like how do i how do i be everything to everyone so you got to pick a side the same way i believe like you have to pick an enemy in your marketing and whether that, whether that's a competitor or some like global force that we all can, can rally yeah. behind, right? Like you got to pick a side. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that described as like, you have to develop a conspiracy and that, that kind of thing too. Like there's, there's this other thing working against you kind of uh, kind of mindset. I've heard that in, in a copywriting class. <laughs> um, speaking of copywriting, you, uh, you said you're a fan of old school, uh, old school copywriting. And, and I imagine that you're probably a fan of Dan Kennedy. Cause you talked about even like direct sales letters. Um, you like for, for copywriting, we, I mean, you've already shared some of your techniques, like where, what are your like inspirational, uh, or who, who are the people that inspired you for copywriting and like, what are some of the cool techniques that you use that you think are effective? And marketing in general, topics? like where, where, what, what the best ideas that you've like kind of gleaned from what, where, where, what's the, uh, yeah. origin of those. And if you don't like Dan Kennedy, yeah. let us know. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I love Dan Kennedy. My only problem is I can't find enough of his stuff. Like I, I would, I wish I could get his like tapes or something like that. Yeah. Um, everything I've read from Dan Kennedy is amazing. He has this one thing in the, in, in, one of my favorite books is the ultimate sales letter, which he wrote. And he has this like one page that's like the 10 questions to ask before writing. And I, I use that almost every time. Um, so on the marketing inspiration, I, I actually, most of my marketing inspiration doesn't come from like people who think they're doing marketing. Like it comes from, I just, I'm just a, I'm super, I'm a super curious person. And I just kind of like observe what gets people to respond. And so, um, my wife and I are in like completely different industries, but like I love watching like what stuff gets her. I'm like, why did you buy that product? And she's like, oh, well, they did this thing and they had this ad. Like, I love just understanding people. And so most of my marketing inspiration has actually come from like understanding social psychology, books like um, Influence by Robert Cialdini, mm. uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Um, you know, books that really talk about uh, how people think and why they make decisions. Uh, more so than like, oh, I love I love Mailchimp or I love Slack. Like those companies <laughs> yeah. are great, but like you know, almost they all do the same thing, right? We are revolutionizing the way blah, and you know they have cool <laughs> colors and logos. Yeah. yeah, or like you know, th this is like people aren't gonna like this, but like I I go to like the grocery store and I look at the placement of the products, like not intentionally, but I just observe, like, oh. You ever notice at Whole Foods how they have that little aisle with all, or Trader Joe's or all with all the little random kind of tchotchkes and stuff right before you check out? Oh my God, that's a little like uh, that's a little frictionless kind of upsell right there. You've already made you've already spent a hundred bucks. So like, what's it? What, why is it a big deal to buy you know two two dollar bars of chocolate? It's genius placement. Like yeah. I just try to try to understand all that stuff. Um, on a, on the copy, uh, the other question was like the copywriting tips and tricks. I gave a lot of them already, which is like be real, be personal. My favorite one though is, um, is I try to like really think about what are all the objections that somebody's going to have about this thing and try to answer them up front in the copy. So I know what you're thinking right now. Like, who really does blank? Like I try to like reverse engineer all that stuff and then work that into the copy and try to like get inside somebody's head. Awesome. Yeah. We did a whole yeah. mini series on uh, Robert Cialdini's book. So we have a six episode mini series covering each of the influence tactics we did earlier. Oh, uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So uh, let's take it one step further because, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, AI and how robots will eventually take over our jobs. Uh, I am of the firm belief that uh, marketing will always be something that will meet that human element. Uh, but, you know, because you work with uh, like your whole platform is basically based on, on a bit of AI, uh, how, where do you see it going? How do you see marketing changing in the next, like, say, 10 to 15 years? And is AI a threat to humanity? <laughs> and, and do you feel uh, personally you responsible you? for it for that? Uh, have you have you seen? Yeah, there's that like Toyota robot that was like making um j like jump shots from half court. Uh, I saw the other day. Yeah, we're we're all screwed. The robots are coming for us for sure. Um, Not for on us the, on the market. We we love them. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. We we that, are you, are you, are you, on the show. Are you saying that? Are you saying that just in case they're listening? Exactly. That, yes. oh, so I we, say listening. That, we say that on the show. Yeah. If you go back to our episodes, yeah. we always say that we uh, we're on the side of the robots if they ever rise up and uh, Skynet becomes live. <laughs> <laughs> um, look uh, on on the marketing side of things, like we're we're actually very bullish on on AI, like at Drift, because the, what we see AI's possibility is is to really like handle all of the stuff that, that, that makes marketers do bad things, <laughs> which is my non scientific way of explaining it. But like, I think that marketing and salespeople don't actually want to spam people or, or like, don't want to blast you or, or like, you know, you, they don't want to make you jump through hoops in order to talk to somebody at the company. And, um, I think they just, they just can't do it because they're trying to do too many other things. And so I think that AI has the possibility to basically like remove all the digital paperwork that comes in marketing. Like it's so ridiculous that a sales rep has to like go and after having a good call with somebody, go and spend 20 minutes entering notes in Salesforce, like to, to make sure that everything is logged properly. Like no sales rep that I've ever met wants to spend their day doing that. Right. Okay, and, can I just stop you for and, one and, second? I, I just, I just need sure. like, like, like two minutes to just gripe about Salesforce because I got to tell you for a, what is supposed to be the biggest like CRM platform in the world, it is. It, I have stepped in things that are more effective than that 
thing. Like, like I, I, just, I okay, that's it. But all I gotta say is like, come on, yeah. like, really, hey. really. Hey, look, look. To, to be honest, like to be honest with you though, like do, do do you love? Do people love the product? No. Um, but they're 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 doing. They did ten billion in revenue last year. Yeah. So like they, they they they're a little bit smarter than than the three of us. They, I they think. do okay. Like, yeah, they do but, okay. You know. But why? I don't I don't get it. It's like I just yeah. I think I think it's because you I think it's because you have to use it right, and and you have to use it, and, and there isn't a better way, yeah. which is like what what we're we're hopeful for the future about wink wink at, at drift right. Well, so, I mean that they're like um, the only one that really is designed for enterprise level companies. Is the that's the main thing going on with with Salesforce. And yeah, they're, and, they're and, first and think about market, it. First to market. Yeah. Here, here's the here's the bad here's the sad part about it. Right. Salesforce is not built is not is not built for um, the people that are using the product. They're, they're built for the managers. They're built for the VP of sales who wants to log in and and see. Uh, see where deals are at and where productivity they're, they're not built for, um, Christina, who I'm looking at across the hall, who's one of our best sales reps. Like she has to use Salesforce because that's what her, that's what the sales management team requires that she uses so she can enter info and we can track pipeline and deals and how the business is doing. Yeah. There's uh, there's yeah. money to be made for a better mousetrap. That's for sure. But anyway, uh, so, so, so where, how do you think marketing is going to look like with, when our kids grow up? Cause you're, you know, we're, we both, we're all three of us. We, we have kids. So where is it going to go in the future? Is it going to be so personalized and so AI driven that, uh, you know, we're going to be continuously manipulated? Like, how, how do you see that happening? I don't think we're going to continuously be manipulated because I think that people's like bullshit meter is so high right now. I really think that marketing's job, this is something that, uh, you know, David, our CEO feels really strongly about and it has like, I've always been like, what is, what is the definition of marketing? He's like, the job of marketing is to help people buy. And I think that that is going to be the next decade, which is like, it is all about helping people buy. It's not about convincing you to buy. It's not about, Hey, jump, Hey, fill out this form and somebody will call you back or, Hey, go through this thing. And then well, it's about like, how can we help you? It's literally about being a tour guide for people yeah. all, all across the internet. And so I think that's going to be the biggest shift is it's the most, it's whoever, my bet would be that is this whoever like the companies that are going to win are the companies that make it easier for people to buy not not more difficult and i would argue that the last decade 20 years of marketing has actually been about making it more difficult and adding in more friction mm, interesting take so less on less coercion and more helpfulness i like that so we we know uh i know you got to wrap up because you've got your your uh, up against the clock there's other things that you have to do uh, today and we really appreciate you uh, being on the show. Will you come back on the show because there's still like so much that I want to talk to you about. Yeah, I'll come back. I'm sweating right now because I got so animated. This is yeah, good. Awesome. Back. But I, I do got yeah yeah. So, we gotta go. We gotta go. But I'll come back. Okay. Right, so right. so uh, before, one last thing. Uh, what are you geeky about right now? What am I geeky about? Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is. Game of Thrones, whatever it is. What do you what, what what's most what are you most geeky about right at this moment? Oh man, sneakers, sneakers. I, I'm a sneaker yeah. head and I've, I've re like, I have this really bad sneaker addiction. I, I love sneakers growing up and then I, and then I like didn't wear them for, for work because I wore like pleated khakis and, and like Kenneth Cole shoes for a while, uh, mm -hmm. which is not a knock on anybody. That's literally what I wore. And then uh, I, got, uncomfortable. I got really bad. Yeah, totally. I really got back into sneakers. And so um, I'm, I'm really heavy into, <laughs> into sneakers right now to the point where, um, my wife is is threatening me about my closet space and that I need to get rid of at least 10 pairs of shoes this weekend. <laughs> Sounds like the exact opposite thing that I deal with. All right. Well, well keep in touch with us because uh, I'm serious. I, I would love to come out to uh, to London. And if you could ever come out to here, to the Netherlands, man, uh, let's hang out. I'll take you to... Uh, uh, all the, the great uh, places and we'll go get quote. And it'll take you to Burning Man too. Let's do it. I, <laughs> hey, sign me up. Year, year 20, year 20, I'm in. When it's your 20th anniversary, I'm going to Burning Man. All right, see you guys. This was so a lot of good. fun. All right, nice All right, take care, brother. Bye. Wow, that was amazing. And uh, I, 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 I think that uh, you know who would really uh, benefit from uh, authentic conversational marketing? Who? Why? Oh! The sex robots. Yes. But of course the sex robot. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is time once again for the sex robot report. Uh! We know you've missed it. It's been weeks. 
It's been weeks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Potty to Bear, for that music. Um, this is a uh, story that comes from thesun.co.uk. Uh, headline, Stuff Crust, Sex Robot, quote, takeaway service, lets pervs rent used dolls for $180 a night, and they get delivered right to your door. They turn right up door. in cardboard boxes just like a pizza. But they're nowhere near as appealing. You know, I first of all, I take issue with this headline because uh, I, I think that that just saying just because someone wants a used sex robot delivered in uh, something equivalent to a pizza box uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're pervy. It means that you they just have different tastes than you do. Second of all, uh, if your sex robot can fit in actually, a pizza box, actually, Andros, if you want a used one, then. There's something going on. If you want to use No, dude, that's, your, that's just your kink. That's just your thing. I mean, this is like a used you, one. I don't want one. I mean, is it washed? I mean, man, is it, how used, listen, how used it, are we it, saying here? Like, how used oh, is it? <laughs> if, it, it? If that's your thing, if your thing is to have sex with a pizza-shaped used sex robot... How could it possibly are? be like a pizza box? A pizza box is thin and like a square... You I know, can't some, imagine some, that a sex robot's going to fit in a pizza box, all right? It's going to be a you know, large believe, Amazon believe Prime not, box. Some guys are that wide. I'm just telling you. That's Wow, wow. That's okay. how it is. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's the latest manifestation of an ongoing sex bot craze. I wouldn't call it a craze. Would you call it a craze? I, I'm not, not sure yet. it's a craze. It's not a craze yet, but it could become a yeah. craze. So I'll leave if it open. That it, could, it. it could be yeah. a craze. By the time you listen to this episode, maybe it's a craze. But right now, on this date, no, it's not. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. If you bring your pizza box sex robot and it's used, uh, I mean, again, it's everyone's kink. But that that you know, it's all a good company. You bring it to like a. But it, it's such dinner. a great discount. One hundred eighty dollars. I don't know what the regular price is, but one hundred eighty dollars. It sounds like a huge discount. I don't know, man. You could get a real live person here in the Netherlands, and it's all legal. So for about the same price, you know. So. I don't but are know. they used or are they are they new? Oh, they would definitely be used. Ooh. Yeah, yeah would definitely. Ooh. <laughs> she she or he would definitely be used. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, sex workers have a right to, uh, life and liberty like everyone else. Um, so it sees, uh, men turning, uh, to lifelike dolls for sexual gratification. We previously seen sex doll brothels, self lubricating sex robots, and even secondhand sex bot trading forums. Now obsessed sex bot fans are renting dolls from Los Angeles based the vivid dolls for a hundred pounds per night. A vivid is now making dolls. Okay. No, it's Vivant. Vivant. Oh, Vivant. It's a it was a different company. Okay. It's a different it's a different company. So customers pick up the doll that they want and order one for uh, one day at a time, and then it turns up in a cardboard box, just like a takeaway pizza. No, not just like an Amazon Prime box. It's not a pizza. It's an Amazon Prime box. Come on. Okay. Okay. With a little smile right on the, right on the box. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, there you go. It, uh, it, if, if you want, uh, you can now have home delivery used sex robots, uh, brought right to your door and but only for a limited time folks only for a limited time act fast or it'll be really really used yeah yeah well uh <laughs> all, all i can say is uh you know again if that's if, if if that's your thing hey if that's your thing you know, you know you're not you're not don't, hurting anybody do as long thing. as long as the the sex robot uh is giving consent i have no problem with it I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to judge you. You do your thing. I'll do my thing, and yeah. we'll all just do our thing. Yeah, we'll just you, you, you. I'll you, you get your pizza delivered one way, and I'll get it delivered another. <laughs> That's. Uh, I like my pizza with pepperoni. You like your pizza with whatever. All right. All right. So, uh, what else you got for me? Um. Well, let's get into the world of geek news shall we yeah yeah so in the world of geek news a lot of stories today uh -huh. a lot of stories um the most importantly 
J.J. Abrams has come out and said that there's more to the story of Ray's parents than previously known. And he's going to reveal it in episode nine. And I, I, I think that I already told we, we talked about this. But Am I supposed uh, to care about this? I, yes, you're supposed to become a Star Wars fan again because J.J. Abrams is doing whatever. Uh, all right, we'll skip that story. Let's go to the next story. The Russo brothers have asked fans of Avengers not to spoil anything in Avengers Endgame. So that goes for you, Andros, who gets to see the movie like two days before I do. You are not allowed to spoil it for me. Well, apparently there is a five minute Avengers Endgame leak. Uh, like the last five minutes of the movie has. Well, I don't want to know it. Don't tell me. I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you. You know what happens? They beat Thanos. No. I, I, oh. No, they don't all die again. I wanted them to. I thought I was hoping they would die again. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> I didn't see before that. I well. Just saw crap well crap now uh did you see the story about the disney plus service so disney plus the stock has been exploding this week by the way it's up to it went from like 108 to 132 ish i think uh-huh. uh maybe even a little bit more um but they announced that not only are they going to have like their entire kids digital series of movies animation movies available on the streaming service but they're also going to have i think it was like 12 of the 18 marvel movies will be on there wow. available for free well as part of it the service will be 6.99 so six dollars and 99 cents a month they're uh they're starting low and that i had read a long time ago that their plan was to do that because they want to they're going to capture market share and then eventually they'll probably raise prices just like every company does um but they're going to have so they're going to have original shows we have uh we have the mandalorian the star wars show we have a Captain, or not Captain America, but Falcon and Winter Soldier show. We have a Loki show. Uh, they just announced another one, which I'm blanking on all of a sudden. There's another show they just announced for. Uh, yeah, and and unlike uh, unlike the uh, Netflix shows, these will actually distinctly tie into the Marvel universe. Correct. That's right. They have announced that these will be part of the canon of the of the Marvel universe. So that's I mean, exciting stuff. And again. Disney did buy 20th, uh, 20th Century Fox or 21st Century Fox, whatever they're called. And they now have access to all of their video library. And a lot of those movies are going to be available through the streaming service. So this is a this is a big one, folks. Uh, I expect them, like anyone that's subscribing to Netflix for kids content alone is probably going to be switching over as it's going to be lower priced. And um, all, all the Disney content that's on Netflix currently will be pulled off. So all that stuff's going to go away. And all the 20th Century Fox stuff probably comes off too, eventually. So Marvel is also releasing a show that is based on the Scarlet Witch and the Vision. It's called, uh, get you ready for it? So I guess, uh, so Scarlet Witch's name, when she's not the Scarlet Witch, is Wanda Maximoff. And the Vision's name is, of course, the Vision because he's a robot. So his name is the Vision. So the show... You ready for the show? Can we do a drum roll? Drum yeah. roll? Give me a drum roll. I, I, uh, here we go. Here we go. Ready? Yep. It's kind All of right. a drum roll. It kind of works. Uh, the show is called WandaVision. One word. WandaVision. Wanda no, Wanda kind of Wanda. like, uh, is that their celebrity couple name? <laughs> yeah, it's like a celebrity couple name. I guess <laughs> that's exactly right. And then the uh, the Captain America, or I keep saying that, the uh, Winter Soldier and Falcon show is called Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Very creative. No. Oh. Wow. They list Falcon first. I always say Winter Soldier and Falcon. They say Falcon and Winter Soldier. So there you go. That's hmm. the title. They have cover art and everything. Somebody somebody in marketing, they ran a focus group, and that's what they came up with. Uh, here's some depressing news. Westworld won't return until 2020. What? So, that's next year. I know. That's in the future. When is I know. Black Mirror coming back? I know. Jeez, Black Mirror hasn't been around. I mean, I, they did Bandersnatch, but that's like a one-episode thing. I know. This is like uh, they were getting into Rick and Morty territory. Yeah, where uh, laziness. Yeah, well, so it, it uh, might be hard to be that creative though. When you're like, I, I can understand that Rick and Morty, they got to make all the jokes be funny. They're, I, I'm sure they have a high standard set for themselves, and and they have to like follow a deadline. I mean, shit, Andres, how long has it been, and we still haven't even put out a book? Come on, I know. Or a, a good book? show. What if we had to do a <laughs> book every year or a show every year? You have to come up with a new show. That's a lot. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if the quality would get any better, to be honest <laughs> yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, the first season's the best. Sorry. Sorry, guys. We're at the high. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, basically, uh, uh, next week, we have another fine guest. We're not going to reveal it now, but this is uh, 
we're working on some really great content. And, um, you know, if you, if you like what we're doing, by all means, please, uh, go to our Patreon page, become a, a contributor. We, uh, we're in the process of revamping the show and making it even a little bit better. Marketing geeks dot, uh, podcast.com is now up and running. Thank you, Justin. Uh, sign up for our email list. And, uh, uh, you know, right now we have, uh, I think, two people. So uh, that means that five of our seven listeners have not signed up yet. That's a shame. So That's a it's shame. Time. It's time. It's time. And with that, another fine edition of the Marketing Geeks. Please connect with us on LinkedIn and uh, leave a review. Let us uh, let people know what you think. If you think we're doing something awesome, tell your marketing geek friends. Yeah, I mean, you can review us on LinkedIn. You can you can send me a uh, what do they call those? A recommendation on LinkedIn. I'll take it. I would say yes. I'm not. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, or you can just go review the show on iTunes like everybody else, and be sure to give an honest review. Whether you hate us, whether you love us, just be honest. Be your authentic self as we preach here on Marketing Geeks all the time. Just be your authentic self. If you're a troll, be a troll. Yeah, that's right. But if you are going to be a troll, be be a troll with Justin. Be an authentic, be an authentic troll. I want you be to be an your troll. best authentic troll you can be. So he uh, he likes it almost as much as he likes used pizzas delivered to his house. Oh yeah, and I do like used pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, everybody, thank you so so much for listening. We really love uh, and uh, your support and your kind words. And with that. Marketing Geeks out. Stay classy.